me back, then you had a choice, I think Steve was <laughs> terrified of me, so. Uh, anyone ever run out of gas? Uh, show of hands? Yeah, I, I know, uh, I used to drive, I used to drive my wife crazy, so she always checks now and asks, you know, how much gas you have. And if I say an eighth of a tank, she says, well, you're, you're an eighth of a tank too late. You should have already gotten more gas. And, you know, I don't know what it is. Maybe a guy thing we like to kind of push our luck or see. But, you know, as it says here on the slide, every year there's over uh, half a million people who uh, have to call for help because they've run out of gas. In fact, uh, running out of gas is right up there with flat tires, dead batteries, and misplaced keys as reasons for roadside help. And, uh, you would think that that would, you know, that was a good excuse in the past when maybe the, the gas gauges weren't as good or, but, you know, nowadays, uh, you get so many warnings, don't you, especially on the new cars, you know, first the yellow light goes on, and then uh, my car actually will say that, uh, you know, in case you haven't noticed your, your yellow lights on here, do you want to know where the nearest gas station is? And you have to say yes or no, press that. And then it also, uh, I have, a, 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 and maybe others of you do too, it'll tell me how many more miles I got left before I'm out. You know, so really, there, nowadays there's no excuse for, for running out of gas. And yet a half a million people still find, uh, find it happening to them. Uh, you know, we could say that people who nowadays, especially with modern cars, who run out of gas, they're, they're really without excuse. You know, we, we shouldn't uh, have to, to worry about that, especially with all the warnings. You know, that if it does happen, you, know, you really have no one to blame but yourself. Well, the, the scripture reading today, uh, and this kind of relates to that scripture reading, because uh, Jesus also said that, you know, I'm the vine, you're the branches. If you remain in me and I am in you, you will bear much fruit. But apart from me, you can do nothing. And apart from gasoline in our cars, the, the cars aren't very good. You know, even if, uh, I like to listen to a couple songs while you're sitting on the side of the road waiting for help. But uh, if we, we look at an example in the Bible of the, the ten virgins, uh, there's a couple things we, we notice. Uh, first of all, there's two groups, the foolish versions of, uh, and the wise versions. I'm saying versions. Virgins. I get it right here. So, really, both groups kind of look the same. In fact, they both uh, fell asleep. They're both uh, in the bridal party. They're both waiting for the bridegroom who represents who? Jesus, Jesus right? Returning. And uh, so the foolish ones had their lamps. They all had their lamps, but they, they didn't take any oil with them. And the wise ones, they took their lamps and had oil with, with them, and the oil being the, the fuel. They all grew drowsy and fell asleep waiting for the bridegroom who was Jesus. And if you remember, when the bridegroom comes and, and the foolish virgin, the virgins realize, we don't, we don't have any oil for our lamps. They ask the wise ones, can you share yours? And the wise one says, well, no, we can't. Otherwise, there won't, there won't be enough for anybody. So if we realize, as we will, as we look a little further, what does that oil in the lamp represent? It represents the Holy Spirit. And so just like the virgins couldn't share their oil, we can't share the Holy Spirit with someone else. Uh, I know my mom, when uh, I, I changed, uh, I was no longer in the Catholic Church, she said, I don't know why you left, we all thought we could get in on your coattails, you know, so I said, my, even if, they, even if I was still in there, that's not true, you know. So, one of the things, then, is the virgins who did not have oil, who were running on empty, came back, and they're saying, Lord, Lord, let us in. And then he says something to them. I, I never knew you. 
I do not know you. And that's, uh, that's similar to another uh, passage in the Bible where many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, that we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles. That's some great stuff, right? That this, this group here is apparently has, has, they've done it at least at one time because uh, you know, next, God doesn't say, no, those are all lies. You, you're just dreaming that. But he says, then I will plainly tell them, I never knew you. That's a passage that gives a lot of people uh, trouble. Because it's like, well, wait a minute. God knows everybody. It's clear in the Bible. He says he knows us. Uh, whether ultimately we're lost or, or saved, he still knew, knows everybody. So why does he say, I never knew you? Well, not only that, he says, depart from me, you evildoers. Some more, more bad news there. Well, let's, let's look at that a little further. You know, when we talk about the Holy Spirit, by the way, with the virgins, the, the lamps represent the Word of God, and the oil represents the Holy Spirit. And you need both. You know, the oil without the, the lamps is a mess. It doesn't do any good, and the lamps without the oil don't function. So you can't, if you, you need both the Word of God and the Holy Spirit to, to benefit, to, to have the light, to be able to share the light. So we, we know that the foolish virgins are destitute of the Holy Spirit. Now this passage here says that we are temples of God. <coughs> And oftentimes we look at this passage and we think of it about that we need to take care of ourselves, which is true, right? We need to physically take care of ourselves, get enough rest, eat right, exercise, and so forth. But it also means we need, need to take care of ourselves spiritually. That, that Holy Spirit, in order to dwell within us, we have to be nourished spiritually. Also, it kind of gives us a warning that not only not to destroy our own temple, but not to destroy other temples. Something else to think about. So, Jesus, did Jesus have any trouble with uh, communicating and trying to get points across with his uh, apostles? You know, time and time again, right? And, you know, he... You know, there's an example, for instance, in Mark, Mark 9, uh, just after the transfiguration, uh, you think that this would be a, a great moment now. Jesus comes, and instead, what's the scene he sees? There's a father whose son has been uh, demon-possessed and has been just keeping this father up 24-7, trying to protect him, from, trying to keep him from harm, while this uh, young boy is, is nearly killing himself. And one by one, the disciples are failing in driving out this demon. And not only are they confused, but it's given the Pharisees watching kind of food for fodder. They're like, all right, look at this. Go ahead, who's next? Let's see, you. Let's see how you can do. So they're not only making a mockery of themselves, they're making a mockery of Jesus. So Jesus comes and he asks the Father, you know, how long has this been going on? And the father tells him for quite a while. And then the father asks him, if there's anything you can do, please help. You know, and Jesus said, whoa, 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 whoa. If? You know, now there's even a more serious development here. Not only have the apostles been unsuccessful in driving out this demon, but now this father of this boy who already had, was down to a thin thread of hope is falling into what we would call unbelief. And here he is standing in front of Jesus, and Jesus said, you know what, we got a bigger problem here. And he says, yeah, it's, all things are possible. In other words, I can do anything for those who believe. And suddenly the father realized where, where his position was. He didn't have any belief. But what had happened to his son had eroded that belief, and he was now in this area called unbelief. The ultimately, if we're, if we're lost, it's when we drift into unbelief. And so, what was the man's prayer? You know, 
my belief, heal my unbelief. And that's a prayer probably all of us need to pray from day to day. Well, it was only after Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came that the apostles were able to receive what power to reach the world with the gospel, that they were allowed to not only preach to the Jews, but also to the Gentiles. And we remember, you know, Peter with Cornelius and how God was working through them to prepare them. Like, by the way, uh, this church, this gospel is going to be going to the entire world. And not only preach to them, but the early church had to learn to accept the Gentiles. We know that that caused a lot of uh, kind of grief within the church itself. But the Holy Spirit is also responsible for preparing individuals to face persecution, imprisonment, poverty, and if necessary, death. Don't ever think that the martyrs ever did anything like that in their own strength. It's clear from their, uh, you know, their stories that it was the Holy Spirit who brought them through that and through any tribulation we have in life. The Holy Spirit helped the church resolve conflicts, to stay united, and to continue forward despite any obstacles. You know, our whole quarterly, this quarter is on unity. You know, without the Holy Spirit, just don't even talk about unity, right? Uh, as human beings, we, we're, we're naturally tending to, to move away from unity. So, and also we know Paul was able to journey onward in his missions uh, to other countries, to other groups, not to be saved, but because he was saved. That's what motivated him, and that's what kept him going through the power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, I remember um, when I was just baptized, you know, it's really an exciting moment. You know, I, I, I learned new truths. I, I, I just, uh, I guess you would say I was on fire. And uh, I remember uh, some people being concerned in the church, well, he's a little too excited. And, uh, one one of the uh, older members actually came up to me and said, well, give us some time and you'll be like the rest of us. Uh, so, yeah. now there, there's, a, there's something the Holy Spirit loves to hear, right? <laughs> so, well, what, what based on uh, pastors and what is the state of the church? What are, we, we could say would be the top ten problems? Apathy, shallowness, worldliness, failure to give, pastoral burnout, teenage dropout, fear of evangelism, flabby self-discipline, I like that's a kind of an interesting description, and uh, maxed out schedules with no real results. So if you look at these problems, uh, also, I'm sorry, chronic shortages of strong, committed individuals within each congregation. It's the exact opposite of the New Testament church, right? Not to say they didn't have any of these problems, but they overcame, came, came, overcame them quickly, and they grew rapidly. So I'd like to go through quickly an actual example of a pastor. His name is Pastor Kidder. Uh, and he talks about his experience. And uh, when he was a young pastor, when he came out of school, he was very enthusiastic. He learned a lot of good techniques about church growth and church management. Uh, but he began to see a couple things he was told uh, a couple times, like, hey, we have finally got the program that's going to finish the work. It's going to finish the work, and Jesus is going to come back. And he heard that the first time, and it didn't happen. And the second time, a couple years later, we got the program now. This is going to finish the work. And Steve and I kind of went through a similar experience with like that in Illinois, uh, where we were told that they were going to use the uh, students from Andrews, and we were going to flood the southwest suburbs of Chicago with Revelation seminars and that this was just going to create a domino effect. And there was going to be rapid growth, and you know this was what was needed. 
And uh, we did a lot of work, but there weren't a lot of results at the end of it because when the students went back to Andrews, they, the, the, where they had their seminars, the people had developed relationships with them. So, so then when they came to our church, they didn't know who we were. And we were kind of overwhelmed because uh, I, I call, we had a, a program called Rent-A-Friend because the pastor was kind of frantically telling us, all right, look, we got, we got some new members that got baptized. Uh, Steve, you take these four. John, you got these four. And, you know, we didn't know these people. And, and we tried, but, you know, they, they left. And, and it got very discouraging because we were putting in a lot of work. So uh, Pastor Kidder, he pastored a church that uh, had 80 members, but they had a vision. You know, you got to have a vision statement, and they have one. They were gonna, they were gonna go up to 600 members. So they actually had some success at first. They grew to 100, and that's when some of the infighting began, and then the attendance dropped to about 40. So he came in at this point, and uh, he was still working on a doctoral degree. And again, in such important factors as leadership and church development. And he rolled up his sleeves, and he was going to use everything he learned through his training. And so for three years, he worked 60 to 80 hour weeks, and his wife even had to help him out 30 to 40 hours a week. So what were the results? Attendance dropped to 30 at the end of those three years. Wow, can you imagine how that feels to put in all that time and effort and to suddenly not only not gain anybody, but lose time. So he decided, you know, I'm not cut off. This isn't what God wants me to do. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a failure at this. So he decided he was going to go back to engineering, which was something else he was uh, he had worked on. They got a degree in, and he convinced himself, you know, why not? I get more money, I get weekends off, and I don't have to deal with any difficult people, which probably he had quite a few to deal with. So he he actually typed a letter of resignation, and he had it up on his computer. He was making some changes to it, and his wife came came by and. And she, she read it. So then she asked him, well, well, why are you resigning? And he said, you know, come on, really? <laughs> you understand that? You know, uh, I want to have a, somewhat of an honorable exit, you know, before we go down to 20 members. So, so his wife asked him, he says, uh, have you been praying for your church? And so, uh, you know, he, he said, well, you know, of course, but then, you know, as he, as he thought about it, he admitted that mainly he was focused on planning and programming, and he really allowed very little time for, for prayer, for spirituality, and for Bible study. So his wife said, well, look, let's try something here. Spend one day a week in prayer, prayer and fasting, and so he said, okay, so he went to the church, and the first morning he, he prayed for about two minutes and fell asleep for eight hours. Probably because he was exhausted, right? <laughs> so uh, came home and told his wife, and he was honest with her. He said, well, I had two good minutes of prayer and, and eight good hours of sleep. And so his wife said, well, keep at it, you know, uh, and pray as if your life depended on it. He really didn't know what that meant, why she was saying that. So uh, even over the next few weeks, he wasn't having very much success with his praying. You know, he went up to three minutes or five minutes and then dropped back to four minutes. And, and uh, he, he f discovered an important truth. He realized he was not wired to do it. He was not wired to pray. You know, for, and, and I don't know, I've, I've come to that conclusion many times that for whatever, various life circumstances and that, you know, prayer was a very difficult thing for me. Uh, you know, I, I had been taught to pray repetitively and 
the more uncomfortable it was, the more God listened to you. And then, then there was a stage where prayer became a competition. I'm like, wow, so-and-so just did 10 minutes. I better do 11 when it's my turn, you know? Uh, and so it, it was, uh, I could understand fully what Pastor Kidder was saying, you know, that he wasn't wired to do it. So, but he still, he kept at it. And, and he, he actually told God that problem. He says, you know, I got a problem here. I don't know how to pray. I don't want to pray. I'm not having success at praying. But as he continued to pray and trying to pray, eventually it started to turn to, to joy and peace. There was a turning point where, you know, I, I love what Ellen White says, where he realized that prayer is nothing more than conversation with God is with a friend. Amen. Isn't that what it is? Yeah. And that's why we can do it anywhere, anytime, all day long. You know, uh, so he looked for time, ways that were and times when he could pray. So he prayed on his walks, and he looked for other ways to, to add prayer to his life. And then he began praying to, to get new members to join his church. So one day there was a visiting family. Uh, they had a couple children. And he greeted them, and they said, well, we came here because I used to work for my boss a long couple years ago, or whatever, five or six years ago. He was an Adventist, and I wasn't a churchgoer. And he told me simply, if you ever decide to go to church, go to the Seventh-day Adventist church, because they're, they're the, the right church. I didn't know what that meant, but we got kids now. My wife and I want to have some church to go to, and you're two blocks away or whatever, so we're, we're trying you out. So, he studied with the family, and he realized how hungry they were to learn about the Bible. And he was feeding that hunger, and he was praying for his family. And eventually they were baptized. And after the baptism, the pastor kind of shared, the pastor Kidder shared with the congregation about his struggles, about his struggles with prayer, about his struggles with relying on programs. And and as he taught, shared his, you know, honestly shared his experiences, other people in the congregation shared theirs. That they also struggled with prayer. And that they were coming to church with heavy hearts for people who were no longer coming to church. Or for young people who just didn't seem to be interested in, in religion anymore. So, they joined Pastor Kidder. And they, they had a, a, kind of what it says here, that the prayer in the church grew like wildfire. So eight years later, the church grew from 30 to 500 active members. Because this church, was, which was on the brink of extinction, realized that it doesn't matter what kind of programs and planning you do, without prayer and the Holy Spirit, uh, it's a waste of time. But with prayer and the Holy Spirit, you, you'll have success. And why is that? Because, remember, the Holy Spirit isn't just going to work on the people out there. It's going to work on the people in here. We, you know, the, the church and the, Old, and the New Testament had to be prepared for Gentiles, for rapid growth, for fairness and distributing food and so forth. So the Holy Spirit has a massive work to do in order to have some, like, some kind of success like that. So the lessons he learned that if we substitute human effort for divine strength, we embezzle God's authority. Everybody knows what embezzle means? Steve and I do, we're, we're former auditors, so you know, we, we dealt with embezzlement. You know, it's a common crime, but it's, it's taking someone else's assets and using them for usually you know, wrong purposes. So the Holy Spirit is a deep reservoir of power, but he cannot flow through a closed tap. So we're, we're the temple. The Holy Spirit resides in us. But we can prevent the Holy Spirit from coming in. Or we can allow him to come in a little bit. I mean, the young wise virgin, virgins, they, they allowed a bit of the Holy Spirit to come in 
but they kind of was a stopping point. So we got to pray that we don't have an unyielding life. And it is prayer that keeps the tap open by keeping the connection constant. And I underline that. We need a constant connection with the Holy Spirit. Amen. Because could that church go from 500 to 30? It, it happens. And it happened to my sister. They, they started a church from around you know, zero. It grew rapidly. I think they got up to 400 members. Things were going great, but uh, suddenly the pastor got a big head. And this was a non-denominational group. Um, there was some other things going on. And the church basically disintegrated within a couple of years, despite growing rapidly and being successful. So that connection cannot be one time or once in a while, it must be constant. Mm -hmm. And he also realized that many of us need to pray for the desire to pray, for the Holy Spirit to remind us. You know, uh, I got, uh, there's a, a guy in our Sabbath school class named Greg at our church, and he's a quadriplegic. And uh, the parts that are working, his shoulder and arms, he, he gets tremendous pain sometimes. So he loves to come to church, but sometimes when he gets there, he, he turns around because the pain is, is too great. So one day he came, and uh, we were, it was just him and I, and he said, uh, you know, I'd like to stay, but I think I may have to go to the hospital. I'm in too much pain. And uh, I felt bad because I could actually see him sweating. So a couple other members came and I said, well, Greg, before you go, let us pray for you. So we, we laid our hands on him and prayed. And uh, it wasn't a long prayer. It's just, you know, we prayed for Greg that he'd get comfort and relief from pain. And then he said, well, maybe I'll stick around for a little bit. And you always tell when Greg's feeling good, because he takes over the class. <laughs> and he goes from, you know, uh, he'll, he'll start talking and talking, and we're all kind of smiling because uh, he, and we, we, and we all, I thought to myself, why, why do we not do that more often? You know, not just with Greg, but other people. Why, uh, wouldn't it be nice if, like Philip with the Ethiopian eunuch, the Holy Spirit says, hey, John, Hey, Steve, uh, pray for this person. Or, you know, book, what we, we think of wasted opportunities. I know I do. Well, Pastor Kidder also identified three models of churches when it comes to prayer and spirituality. The first one is called the prayerless church. And that doesn't mean they don't pray. It just means that it's, 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 it's regulated. It occurs casually. It's dictated by the bulletin uh, or by the traditions within the church. So it's, 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 it's a once in a while thing. It's not a, a constant thing. And then the second model was a church with prayer. And they take prayer a little more seriously, so much so that they may have a, a group of, well, I guess, prayer warriors, you know that term? So they say, well, we got a big issue here. Let's turn it over to the prayer warriors. Uh, so they have people who, in the church, this church, that, that do pray and take prayer seriously, and they're probably spiritually gifted for prayer. But the, the congregation kind of leaves the heavy praying to them, and, and, and they're not really involved with it. And then the third one is a church of prayer. And this is a church where prayer is at the, at the center of everything. Everything they do, everything they don't do. You know, they ask the Holy Spirit, guide us, lead us. What are we gifted at? What are we not? What should we do? What shouldn't we do? They pray about everything. And, you know, what Jesus say? Uh, his house is a house of what? Prayer. prayer. So he, he did a survey, he explained this to uh, various uh, Christians he met over the years. And he asked, well, what do you think your church is? So he said, for a prayerless church, about 15% of them said, well, yeah, we're, we fit that category. And for a church with prayer, with the prayer warriors, 
And about 85%, yeah, we're in that category. And a church of prayer, 5%. So that means that 95% of the churches treat prayer as a formality or a ministry of the few. And then we wonder, where's the Holy Spirit? <laughs> well, what about unanswered prayer? That comes up quite a bit, right? Well, what about when, when the request is wrong? Well, God says no. We may not realize it's wrong. But, and when the timing's wrong, God says slow, you know, wait, it'll, it'll be done in my time. And when you're wrong, God says grow. You know, uh, I don't think he actually meant let's go out there and move mountains, right? <laughs> uh, what he meant was you have this power in prayer, but you need to use it as you're growing in the spirit, as you're growing in the word, so you're not, uh, you know, Asking for ridiculous things, basically. But when everything's right, God says, let's go. So I'd like to end by, by talking about a friend of mine. Uh, his name is Dave. And uh, Dave, Dave and I kind of became friends. It was kind of interesting because we, we just met each other down at the building where I worked at in downtown Minneapolis. And we were in the, the little workout room there. And as we talked, we... We both at that time had kind of an interest in running, and we found out that we were equally slow. We had the same slow pace. So we would go out and two or three times a week go for a run. Uh, downtown Minneapolis, there's a nice uh, little three and a half mile circle around the uh, Mississippi River, Stone Arch Bridge. And, and we got to know each other better. Uh, we got to talk a lot and kind of share each other's uh, good things and bad things going on in our life. And uh, it was interesting because we both decided at the same time that we liked Florida in the wintertime. So he and his wife Kay bought a place and he, he came and told me one day, I think we were at lunch, he said, hey my wife Kay and I bought a place in Florida. I said, oh, really? I said, well, uh, Sue and I are going to be renting a place. Here's the address. Why don't you see how close we are? Maybe we can get together for lunch or around the golf or something. And a week later, he sends me an a email with a, a photo. He says, here's a, a picture of the place you're renting. We're about a mile from you. So, uh, he went to this development. They were having a garage sale. So we, we got to, it was kind of nice because we both retired. We've got to kind of be able to continue that relationship down in Florida. And uh, the Seventh-day Adventist Church down there, uh, five years ago, they, they tried this, uh, they have a 5K race uh, Sunday morning along with the health fair. And it's, uh, it's really done well. So, so the first year knowing Dave was a runner and also that his wife Kay liked to run, I said, hey, uh, our church here is having a 5K race. Would you like to Oh, he goes, oh, sure. So, um, as uh, we're in the parking lot, I saw another friend from the Minnetonka Church, whose name also was Dave. I said, hey, Dave, listen, I got a couple friends here. You know, uh, they're doing a race. They're not going to know anybody. Could you, you know, at least say hi to them? He said, yeah, yeah, sure. So it ends up as this friend Dave from Minnetonka Church goes and talks and finds out, okay, Dave's wife works for the accounting firm that does the work for his business. So there's an immediate connection there. And other things kind of fell into place. And they, uh, they come and do the race uh, every year. In fact, uh, Kay won her age group a couple times, which she had never done before. So she was ecstatic. You know. So it was that kind of, you know, that's kind of the kind of relationship we had. So uh, one day I, I get a text a couple uh, months ago. And Dave said, uh, can you get together for breakfast or something I need to talk to you about? And you know, you get that kind of feeling like, okay, something's going on here because we, we go for breakfast, but it's not always followed by this that there's something I need to talk to you about. 
So I said, sure, we set up a time, we met at Perkins, and I could tell right away when I walked in, something was, was wrong. You know, you can tell right away with friends or family if something's wrong. So, uh, and I could tell Dave was struggling eating his breakfast. So finally, um, he told me, he said, well, uh, I got some news. I went to the doctor. I found out I got a, a tumor in my colon. He said, but, you know, I, I go for regular colonoscopies, so they feel, you know, pretty certain it's, it's contained. And, it's not too big a deal. And then I said, oh, I said, okay. And I, th I thought that was what we were there for. Dave said, so I, anyway, I was at the doctor. I got up to leave, and the doctor said, well, wait, sit back down. That's the good news. No. And so he proceeded to tell Dave that these tests we run, they're also showing some shadows that indicate you may have some involvement with cancer in your bones. And uh, that's, uh, of course, a lot more serious. And, and he said, and in addition to that, there's a possibility your pancreas may be involved. So as he's telling me this, I'm praying like, Lord, uh, you know, because I'm not, I don't, in the past, I've never been able to handle these situations but, you know, well when somebody I know is, is, is sick and facing serious consequences and I said Lord take over you know because I, I, I don't want I don't know what to say here so I just listened and he just kept talking and telling me about how hard it was to tell his family and, you know how uh, his, he, his oldest granddaughter could sense something was going on they were trying to keep it from the grandkids and he had to tell her and, uh, you know, it was this heartbreak. So I said, well, it was crowded in the restaurant. I said, well, let's, why don't we, you know, I, I got the check, and I said, let's, let's go out in the parking lot. So we found somewhere a little quieter. Uh, I said, Dave, I want to pray for you. He said, okay. So I wrapped my arms around him, and I don't remember exactly what I said, but, you know, I started praying for him, for peace and strength and, you know, for whatever lie that lied ahead to, because I wasn't going to say, you know, heal him completely, you know, I don't know what lied ahead, so, but I prayed for him to get peace and strength and for what lied ahead. And then I prayed for his family, for them, and I prayed for the, the surgeons and the other medical staff. And, uh, you know, I told God, I said, you know, I love Dave as a brother. And, uh, and that I'm concerned about him, and a lot of people are. So uh, after we got done, I told him again I loved him. You know, I gave him a hug. He told me he loved me too. We had never said that before. And I said, Dave, I said, keep me posted. You know, the tests were coming up that week. I said, and if you need me, if you need to talk, if you, you know, call me. And he said, okay, I will. So, uh, a couple days later, first test, he gets it, so he sends me a text. He said, well, good news, further testing, they found there's no cancer in the bones. So, okay, good, but the next one's a big one, you know, the pancreas. So that's a couple days later. So, get the second one, I'm kind of afraid to, to look at it, I know what it's about. And he says, there's absolutely no involvement with the pancreas. Extensive tests were uh, taken, and I could tell how relieved he was. Yeah. You know, never was anyone so happy to just have colon cancer. <laughs> and uh, I could read that. So, but now he still has to have the, the surgery for the, the tumor. And so he has the surgery, and I get the third message that, uh, it went well, they got everything, no findings that there were any possibility of spread. And in fact, there was going to be no need for chemo or radiation. And that they felt he would heal up enough to be able to go to this wedding he had been looking forward to, he and his wife had been looking forward to, to go in Spain. So it was like, praise God. You know? So after he got back from Spain, 
we, we got together for breakfast again, and uh, you know, he looked like a different person, you know, then with this burden lifted. But uh, he said something interesting. He said that, uh, you know, until you prayed for me, I was so wrapped up in thinking about myself and everything that was going on, I didn't even think about my family and what they were going through. And he said it, it, it took my mind off of just focusing on me and also realizing that this was impacting them too. And uh, so I said, yeah, that, that's why I'm glad you realized that. And I don't remember, I hope we did, but we should have had a prayer of thanks in the parking lot. I think we did, but I, I can't remember. I was just so happy how everything turned out. Uh, but the point, the reason I bring up that story is, is that, you know, it's amazing how the Holy Spirit works. You know, the Holy Spirit is, is out there doing things, ready to do things, that we don't even realize. You know, he's, he, he was working with Dave, and, and somehow told Dave, Call John, meet him for breakfast. You know, have prayer. So, you know, they would know if, if if whatever happened, it was in God's hands. So, it's just some final thoughts. You know, Pentecost revealed that the Holy Spirit is more powerful than we can ever imagine. And the good news is, we're we're promised an even greater outpouring than the Pentecost, right? And prayer is a means that prepares us for the Holy Spirit to work through us and in us. Too often, and this is I hope you this, we, we turn to prayer as a last resort instead of the first resort. And I think somebody actually brought that up in, in a Sabbath school class, that you know, we need to pray for all things, even small things, right? Nothing's too small or too big for God. But you also need to not worry about what other people think. You know, uh, Pastor Kidder also had people who were critical of this sudden prayer ministry that developed, saying, you know, it's a waste of time, blah, 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 whatever. So that uh, expected kind of, right? There's going to be people who are not going to be comfortable with that, and, and uh, you just pray for them. And finally, you know, like the oil that fed the lamps and also the lamps that were fed in the sanctuary, those lamps were never supposed to go out, right? They were supposed to be constantly fed with the oil symbolizing the Holy Spirit. And likewise, we need the Holy Spirit to flow through us constantly. That's why we're talked about being filled with the Holy Spirit. You know, the Holy Spirit is not satisfied with, with uh, owning half the temple or three quarters of it. He wants full occupancy. And that means we have to allow him to, to clean the temple just like Jesus cleaned the temple back in his day. So let's, uh, let's pray. Father Heaven, uh, this sermon today, uh, I'll be honest that I don't know what the Holy Spirit is capable of. I've sensed the Holy Spirit's working, but I also sense it's just the tip of the iceberg. So I pray that we here today would, would first of all be encouraged to pray. And if we're not people, if we're, we struggle with prayer, that you would give us the ability to find prayer to be not only a, a routine and a habit, but a joy. We thank you for that privilege in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, John. I just want to ask you, because you're my best friend, right? Yeah. So I didn't tell you I preached about this last year, right? No. Holy Spirit working. He's